Hello and welcome. My name is Deborah Dwork, and I serve as the founding director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. The mission of this new center is to promote the exchange of ideas across disciplines and generations. It aims to serve as a hub for a vibrant community of scholars with convergent interests. And as I hope you will agree after the panel today, as a forum for innovative research, graduate student mentoring and public programming. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our inaugural event in honor of Barbara and Galking and Jan Grabowski, new scholarship on the history and memory of the Holocaust in Poland. The happy task of introducing our chair and moderator, Dr. Joanna Sliva falls to me and the honor of introducing our stellar panelists and star respondents falls to her. To our speakers, I say only thank you for the work you do. To the Melvin S. Cutler Charitable Foundation and its founder, CUNY graduate Mel Cutler, many thanks for your generous support of this program. And thanks to you, everyone who has joined today for your interest and your time. There is much to say about Dr. Joanna Sliva, and so I will be short to avoid growing long. Dr. Sliva is a historian at the Claims Conference. Her scholarship, beyond the remit of her job, focuses on Polish Jewish history and the Holocaust in Poland. Dr. Sliva's outstanding first book, Jewish Childhood in Kraków, a micro history of the Holocaust to be published in September, received the prestigious Ernst Frankel Prize for 2020 from the Wiener Holocaust Library. The recipient of fellowships from Fulbright, Yad Vashem, and the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, Dr. Sliva is on to a new co-authored project called Counterfeit Countess, the Jewish mathematician who rescued Poles during the Holocaust. Dr. Sliva, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Dwork, for this generous introduction. I would like to welcome our honorees, our presenters, and all our guests. It is my great privilege to moderate this session in honor of two esteemed scholars of the Holocaust, Professors Barbara Engelking and Jan Grabowski. The research of Professors Engelking and Grabowski has brought to our attention the importance of new, source, of new sources, in particular Jewish testimonies that illuminate various aspects of the Holocaust in occupied Poland. Their findings challenge the politicized narrative that has been central to the agenda of the current Polish government. Their work makes evident that local complicity in the Holocaust took various forms and that assistance given to Polish Jews was not the norm. For that, the two historians have faced a smear campaign. Most recently, a court in Warsaw decided that the two scholars would need to apologize for using information that emerged from the archival record. The question arises, what is the future of scholarship on the Holocaust in Poland? Even in this atmosphere, Polish scholars continue to examine the complexities of Holocaust history. And their work is becoming increasingly available in English. 
And because we are focusing on new research in this session, I would like to highlight Łukasz Krzyżanowski's book, Ghost Citizens, about Jewish survivors returning to their hometown, a book published in 2020 by Harvard University Press. Katarzyna Persson's book, Warsaw Ghetto Police, was published just last week by Cornell University Press. The work of professors Engel King and Grabowski continue to inspire scholars outside Poland. The three presenters who will speak today represent a cohort of a new wave of scholars who are involved in cutting edge research on Holocaust history and memory. Our first speaker will be Miranda Brether, who is a PhD student in history at the City University of New York's Graduate Center. Miranda completed her MA at the University of Ottawa, where she was advised by Professor Grabowski and where she studied relations between Jews and Gentiles in hiding. Miranda's dissertation under the supervision of Professor Dagmar Herzog focuses on the role of Polish village elders during the German occupation in the Lublin district. Our second presenter, Alicja Pudbielska, is a PhD candidate at the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. In less than two weeks from now, she will defend her dissertation titled A Tree for Poland, the Memory of Holocaust Rescue in Poland, 1942 to 2018. Starting in the fall, Alicia will be the Hartman Fellow at the Yale University's Fortune of Video Archive. And our third presenter is Jonathan Zysuk, who is a PhD candidate in sociology at the CUNY Graduate Center. Jonathan received an MA in Modern Jewish History from Yeshiva University. He is a visiting researcher in the Department of Jewish History and Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University of, Jeru of Jerusalem. He has received numerous fellowships, including a Fulbright to conduct his dissertation fieldwork in Poland. We will hear from the three presenters, followed by our two respondents, Professors Engelking and Grabowski. I will then open the discussion. To message for our, to our guests, you may use the Q&A function throughout the program to post your questions to the panelists. And now I turn over the screen, the floor to you, Miranda. Thank you so much, Joanna. Located in the Eastern Polish countryside, the three action Reinhardt camps of Treblinka, Belzec, and Sobibor were constructed in close proximity to a number of towns and villages. One of such places was Woldava, an Eastern Polish town nestled between dense forests in the west and the Bug River to the east. During the German occupation, Woldava's town center was located around 10 kilometers from the Sobibor extermination camp where approximately 250,000 European Jews were murdered from May 1942 to October 1943. For Voldava residents, the extermination camp became part of the everyday geography of the region. Local Poles and Ukrainians heard the sounds of gunfire and witnessed and smelled smoke as they conducted errands and moved around the county. My research asks how the proximity of the Sobibor death camp shaped occupation era Jewish Gentile relations in the town of Voldava. Tracing the lines of communication between Sobibor and Voldava, I argue that local knowledge of the murder of Jews at Sobibor drove the plunder and takeover of Jewish goods and property in and around the town. In this paper, I begin with the theft of Jewish possessions from the first days of the occupation and conclude in the post-war era, as Voldava residents continue to hunt for alleged Jewish gold on the grounds of the former death camp. Prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, Voldava was a vibrant center of Jewish life. Out of a community of 9,300 inhabitants, over 60% were Jews. Typical of the Eastern European shtetl, the Jewish population was concentrated in Voldava's town center, while Gentile residents lived and worked on agricultural land encircling the town. The communities maintained their own social, religious, and political infrastructure. 
while the economic sphere remained an important space of interaction between Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews. Every Thursday morning, there was a weekly market in the town square during which Polish and Ukrainian farmers would come to the town with foodstuffs and then shop in nearby Jewish-owned stores. Pre-war Jewish-Gentile relations were frequently fraught with tension. In the 1930s, economic depression, along with a turbulent political environment, heightened violence and economic restrictions against the Jews. The occupation of Moldova in 1939 began in this context of economic and political stress, accompanied by increased anti-Semitism and acts of anti-Jewish violence. In September 1939, Moldova was tossed between German and Soviet control. The German army initially occupied Moldova in mid-September, retreated from the Red Army, and then reoccupied Moldova in October. At this time, the Germans consolidated the pre-war Polish counties into larger administrative areas. Moldova was part of Kreis Holm, located within the Lublin district of the general government. Immediately from the beginning of the occupation, the German authorities occupied the best homes in the town for their own quarters and confiscated all furs and valuables from the Jewish residents under the threat of execution. Around the same time, the authorities repurposed the Voldava synagogue, which was converted into a granary for Polish farmers. A set of policies from 1940 and 1941 restricted the space in which Voldava Jews could live and placed unprecedented strain on their material lives. Around the beginning of 1941, the German authorities created an open ghetto in Vladava. From mid-1941 onwards, testimonies detail forced separation from the Gentile population, the resettlement of Jews from nearby villages and towns, as well as extreme food rationing. To alleviate material strains, Jewish residents traded with their Gentile neighbors. Although the regular Thursday market no longer officially operated, Poles came into the city to exchange foodstuffs for jewelry, money, or anything local Jews could offer, taking advantage of the deleterious condition of Jews in the ghetto and desperate to alleviate their own material constraints. In April 1942, German authorities ordered the Vodava Judenrat to deliver 150 Jews to the nearby Sobibur train station to begin construction work. Such a rapid mobilization for forced labor would not have appeared out of the ordinary to inhabitants of the Voldava ghetto. In 1940 and 1941, numerous work camps were established around the town and most of the population was already engaged in forced labor. It was, however, during and following the construction of the Sobibor extermination camp that both Jewish and Gentile residents from the surrounding area began to speculate about the occupier's future plans for Voldava's Jewish inhabitants. Immediately after the 150 forced laborers were taken to the Sobibur railway station, Motel Rabinovitz learned from his German forced labor supervisor that, to quote his post-war testimony, something was being built in Sobibor which would become known around the whole world. Leon Lemberger also learned only three days after the workers were taken away that the Germans were building a crematorium near Sobibur while Jakob Friedman overheard around the town that they were experimenting with gas on the Vladava workers. How did these Jewish residents learn about the construction of murder facilities behind the fences and barbed wire near the Sobibor railway station? According to post-war testimonies, when the construction project was complete, the Germans decided to test the murder mechanisms on the workers. When the workers were brought naked to the newly constructed gas chambers, a few of them began to suspect that they would be killed and attempted to flee. Two or three individuals managed to escape to Voldava in the middle of the night and reported their experiences. News of the murder of Jews at Sobibor quickly spread around the town. The destruction of the Jewish community in Voldava took place over the course of five liquidations spanning a year. In Voldava, the multiple phases of ghetto liquidations allowed the fate of the deportees to spread rapidly within the surviving community. Due to the proximity of the Sobibor death camp, and as the liquidation of the Voldava took place over rounds of Akjanen, by late summer 1942, many Jews in the town were aware of the fate of those sent on transports to Sobibor. Jakob Friedman testified that as the trains were packed during a liquidation action, everyone in Voldava knew where the deportees were going. In her post-war video testimony, Pearl Rotter explains that from their balcony at night, her family could see and smell the smoke from burning corpses at Sobibor. Ida Lichtman, 
working in the camp laundry, witnessed a transport from Voldava. The train cars, she recalled, were missing many boards, a sign that people had made a desperate final attempt to survive. By the summer of 1942, news of the Sobibor extermination camp had traveled through Voldava and even across the general government, as evidenced in a letter sent from Voldava to Warsaw in June 1942, warning those in the Warsaw ghetto about upcoming liquidations. For those working and living in Sobibor's vicinity, it was difficult to remain oblivious to the murderous reality. Michał and Irena Soiko, both workers at the local railway station, separately testified that they knew Jewish prisoners were brought from Voldava and across Europe to a camp at Sobibor, but could not speak as to how the prisoners were treated in the camp. Irina Soiko, however, inferred from the smell of burning human flesh that they were killing people there. Josef Malinsky, a worker in the nearby forest, detailed in a 1945 testimony that some individuals were selected for work while others were liquidated in the gas chambers. Others, perhaps having overheard rumors about the existence of Sobibor, but uncertain as to the precise mechanisms of murder, referred euphemistically to the strangling or poisoning of local Jews. For the Gentile population of Voldava, the liquidations offered an unprecedented opportunity to claim possessions and property that had suddenly been left behind. As illustrated in the testimonies above, Many local Gentiles knew that the Jews deported to Sobibor were murdered and would not be returning to their homes and belongings. One resident of Voldava, Roman Ostrovsky, witnessed Pyotr Sterba breaking down the doors of Jewish apartments with a rifle during an action. Ostrovsky added that Sterba was widely considered a bandit in the town. After the roundups, as Voldava Jews walked to the Orhovec train station, Gentiles demanded their belongings. Rachel Birnbaum and her family were denounced in hiding by the Polish woman who had taken ownership of their business at the beginning of the occupation. As they were led to the train station by the Germans, Birnbaum remembers Polish residents laughing and telling them to throw down their jewelry. As they were loaded onto the train, Birnbaum was taken out of the group for work while her entire family was sent to Sobibor. Another survivor watched local Gentiles creep into the town the night following the action in April 1943 to collect anything left behind. From May 1942 to April 1943, nearly all of Voldava's Jews were murdered at the Sobibor death camp. During the five phases of liquidations, Jews and Gentiles increasingly deduced from the violent nature of the liquidations and the persistent smell of burning bodies that those deported to Sobibor would never return to the town. Personal accounts of the liquidation period highlight the intense emotional and psychological implications of this realization for the Jewish community, which motivated many survivors to leave the town, enter into hiding, or join the partisans. The liquidation period simultaneously marked the peak of violence against the Jews, the moment at which many community members learned of the murder campaign at Sobibor and awarded the Gentile community with sudden prospects for financial and professional advancement. The liberation and immediate post-war years did not mark the end of the plunder and robbery of Jewish belongings. Locals flocked to the grounds of the former extermination camps for decades after the war to hunt for alleged Jewish gold. An Israeli journalist who visited Vodava in the immediate post-war period recorded that every piece of earth in the area surrounding Sobibor was turned over by locals taken by what he called a wild wave of gold fever. His local guide believed that if one was dedicated to the search, gold could still be found around the railway station. By the time of the first liquidation of the Voldava ghetto, and increasingly as the liquidations continued until April 1943, Gentile and Jewish residents of Voldava knew of the existence of the Sobibor extermination camp. From the escape of the initial workers at the camp in April 1942, to the smell of burning bodies which infiltrated the surrounding area, there were constant, unavoidable signals that the Jews who were deported to Sobibor would not be returning. Ultimately, this local knowledge of the murder of Jews overwhelmingly encouraged and facilitated the economic exploitation of Jewish neighbors. Thank you. And I invite Alicia to the floor. Thank you, Miranda. Um, just a second. OK, 
Okay, um, here we go. I'll be speaking today about efforts to turn commemoration of rescue into nationalist propaganda in Poland. Um, and my main argument is that not only the commemoration of rescue does not follow or reflect scholarship as collective memory rarely does, but it, that is, it is actually actively used to suppress independent and critical research on uh, the Holocaust in Poland. And to make that point, I'll address three issues. First, I'll speak about the role that the memory of rescue played in the libel suit brought against Professor Engel King and Professor Grabowski. Then I will examine other activities by the de facto plaintiff, the Polish League Against Defamation, uh, other activities uh, by that organization carried in the name of honoring Polish rescuers. And before I conclude, I will put the current attempts to influence history writing in Poland into a historical perspective. So what struck me about uh, the suit against Professor Grabowski and Professor Engel King, which was the most radical assault on um, the freedom of Holocaust research in Poland to date, was that the memory of rescue was at the very heart of the case. Without going into too much details, uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with the, with the story, uh, but here's a reminder um, about the story of, of rescue, of assistance at the heart of the lawsuit. Uh, during the war, a Polish village mayor assisted a Jewish woman uh, to assume a false identity and escape into East Prussia as a Polish forced laborer. Uh, he did it for payment and in the process, he also robbed her of all her belongings, which she actually really needed to continue her fight for survival. She did survive uh, thanks to her own resourcefulness uh, with the assistance of some other Poles. After the war, uh, she testified in court um, on behalf of the mayor in his defense, even though she actually believed that he was an instrumental accessory uh, in the hand and capture of several dozen other Jews. So the story we have is actually quite typical um, story about assistance by Poles to Jews. It's complex, it's ambiguous. There are no clear cuts between um, helping, exploiting, and collaborating. Uh, the plaintiff, however, uh, demanded that historians adhere to the categories promoted by propaganda. They argued in court that the village mayor was in fact, and I quote, a Polish hero who risked his life to rescue Jews. The right-wing media, including the state TV, charged that scholars turn a rescuer into a murderer or turn the righteous into anti-Semite. And I'm showing you uh, just a couple headlines from the Polish media, uh, insisting that those very clear um, opposite categories were in fact switched. I would like to make three observations about those statements, which are quite characteristic of the dominant discourse on rescue in Poland in general. Um, first of all, any kind of assistance to Jews is deemed heroism. No matter the motivation, no matter the payment rendered or not, um, no matter the treatment of the Jews. Second, the possibility that one can uh, both help and exploit is firmly rejected. Uh, and finally, such duality is also rejected when it comes to the nation as a whole. So the propaganda insists on inequivocal and, and final answer to the question that I posed in the title of, the, of my presentation, which is were Poles blackmailers or the righteous? Were Poles murderers or rescuers? And of course, in the nationalist optic, 
actions of individuals always are a statement of the collective character. So accordingly, the lawsuit alleged that not just the village mayor's memory was tarnished, but also uh, all Poles, national identity and pride. So now that we looked a little bit at the rhetoric of the propaganda, I want to turn the focus to, um, to its proponents and, and actors. And when we talk about uh, Polish politics of memory, we usually focus on the government and the ruling party, law and justice, uh, but I want to focus on a different type of actor uh, represented by the Polish League Against Defamation, um, which was um, de facto plaintiff in the case against Professor Grabowski and Professor Engel King. Uh, the Polish League Against Defamation is a right-wing nationalist organization, non-government organization, uh, with close ties to the ruling law and justice party. Uh, and a recipient on several government grants, including funds from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was founded in 2013. And the significant part of the League's activities is carried out uh, in the name of honoring Polish rescuers. And I just want to look at details at one of them. So, in the winter of 2018, um, in response to the backlash after uh, the attempt to introduce so-called Holocaust speech law in Poland, uh, many institutions and organizations came out with reminders about uh, Polish help to the Jews. Uh, the League Against, um, the Polish League Against Defamation produced a series of infographics that were widely shared um, on the social media. Mm, this series was called Out of the Kindness of the Heart, Poles Who Saved Jews. And just a couple of comments about, um, about that particular uh, product. So, mm, of course, the infographics presented, let's say, very flattering um, image of, of Polish help to Jews as, as altruistic as community supported and as, as massive in scale. Mm. A very um, specific group of rescuers has been highlighted uh, in those materials. Um, those rescuers fit uh, the ideolog ideological profile of the, of the league. Uh, and so uh, the focus was on um, supporters of the right wing, uh, members of the far right organizations, such as the National Armed Forces. Um, there was a strong focus on um, members of the Polish police, on uh, anti-Semitic rescuers, although anti-Semitism was always uh, in quotation marks, and a strong focus on uh, peasants, and especially on peasants, um, from the broadly defined vicinity of, of Treblinka, mm, the subject of um, disputes starting uh, with um, the golden harvest and then recently a night without end, uh, Professor Grabowski's chapter on that area mm, and very strong effort by, by, the, by, the, by the opponents to, uh, to present very positive image of um, uh, Poles' attitudes in that region. Um, another thing we might notice, uh, those infographics were produced both in Polish and English. Um, the goal is always to not only address the Polish society, but also to voice those historical grievances to the international Western audience. And um, a very pointed use of the, of the word neighbors, uh, which of course is a is a significant term in the, in the discourse on Polish-Jewish relations uh, since the publication of Jan Tomasz Gross's book. Um, so just a couple more comments about the, the League and its activities. Um, 
the league is very successful in procuring public funds and um, enjoys a huge visibility between um, social media and um, its use of, of posters in public spaces. And it's also able to mobilize its supporters to uh, participate by um, sharing that content and also harassing scholars, either by contacting them directly or, or by complaining to their employers. Which brings me to my last point, and I will skip uh, the part about other activities by the league. I want to speak very quickly about um, pressures on Holocaust scholarship in Poland historically before I conclude. Because, uh, of course, this is not new. Um, those pressures have been applied to the Jewish Historical Institute, um, peaked in March 1968, and then um, Polish Institute of National Remembrance um, led the backlash against um, Jan Tomasz Gross's publications and now against the publications by the Polish Center, um, the Holocaust Research. And there are also other institutions, uh, such as Pileski Institute, that not necessarily um, try to suppress the independent scholarship, but uh, try to produce a scholarship that is perhaps more in line with the expectations of the government. So I just want to conclude by um, emphasizing that point that not only um, the memory of rescue contradicts what we know from research, but also the commemoration of rescue is actively used to suppress that research. The Polish League Against Defamation not only attacked um, scholars of the Holocaust, but also did it in the name of honoring and commemorating Polish rescuers. Um, thank you. And now I turn the floor to Jonathan. Jonathan, you have to unmute. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry for that technical difficulty. In the early years of the 21st century, Poland reckoned with its past unlike any other nation in Central and Eastern Europe. A public debate raged over the history of the Holocaust under German occupation and the scale of Polish involvement. This debate was initiated by historian and sociologist Jan Tomasz Gross's work on the Edwabne massacre which problematized the narrative of exclusive Polish victimhood and heroism during World War II. 
For the first time outside of small intellectual and literary circles, the Polish public was confronted in earnest with the uncomfortable reality of mass indifference, complicity, and even instances of local collaboration. Poland's difficult past was now out in the open. In response to the awful discovery of that Yedwabna's Jews were murdered by Poles, then president of Poland, Aleksander Kwasniewski famously apologized in 2001, begging the shadows of the dead and their families for forgiveness. At that time, the president's remarks reflected a critical approach to the past as a means of building a new and more pluralistic future in a free and democratic Poland, where the genocide of Polish Jews, including instances of Polish Catholic involvement, could be incorporated into an inclusive narrative of Polish history. Kwasniewski's convictions, however, were not accepted by all, if ever a majority of the Polish public, and stimulated fierce political responses, including from the current president of Poland. During a 2015 presidential debate, then presidential candidate Andrzej Duda criticized the incumbent Bronisław Komorowski for similarly apologizing for Yedwabne. Duda claimed that Komorowski had undermined Poland's real historical memory, which he would seek to defend if elected. Shortly after, in his first inaugural speech as president, Duda declared, the good name of Poland needs to be defended. We Poles have a great history. We have nothing to be ashamed of. On the contrary, we should be proud of it. What exactly is the real historical memory that requires defending? According to sociologist Antoni Suek, it can be summarized succinctly. One, Poland represents a nation of heroes and warriors wronged by history and their neighbors. Two, Poland has always been welcoming to others, especially Jews. This self-adoration, Sua continues, pertains principally to wartime, which has shaped the core auto stereotype of the Polish martyr and the Polish hero, and is thus constitutive of a myth of innocence developed in response to World War II. When faced with countervailing evidence, such as the Edwabna massacre or other instances of violence perpetrated by individual Poles against Jews, many Poles, according to data analyzed by Suek, take on an apologetic stance towards the past. Consequently, Duda was not only defending a distorted image of the past, but he was also using his vision of the past as an instrumental political tool. The current government in power views critical investigations of Polish-Jewish relations, such as Professors Engel King and Grabowski's work, Daliest Notes, as a threat to its conception of national identity. Indeed, as Suwak again notes within this framework, if Poles were to abandon their positive conceptions of their wartime behavior towards Jews, painful modifications of the entire image of the nation might ensue. It thus becomes a political imperative to prevent this from happening. Duda implied as much in 2015. His remarks, however, were not made in isolation. They were an expression of a larger political program. Part of the raison d'etre of the law and justice government has been to defend Poland's good name. Since rising to power, law and justice has employed a policy on history or politica historyczna to reaffirm a positive image of the past, especially as it relates to the history of the Holocaust and the Second World War. In a period of rapid political and economic transformation following the collapse of communism in 1989 and European Union enlargement in 2004, the law and justice government asserted that a policy on history was fundamental to fostering social solidarity and national pride. What was needed according to government leaders and ideologues 
was an affirmative approach to collective memory that would counter notions of critical patriotism advocated by the intellectual, political, and religious Catholic elite that emerged during the Advabna debate. A new and positive national identity drawing upon the romantic model of Polish heroism and suffering was deemed of utmost importance in the wake of Poland's accession into the European Union. Jarosław Kaczynski, the undisputed leader of law and justice, determined that a quote, national community based upon historical memory, end quote, had to be restored and consolidated. Or in other words, a policy on history which would challenge the so-called pedagogy of shame, as Kaczynski elsewhere termed it. Building directly on previous attempts, the law and justice government has overseen what I argue is a three-pronged approach to instrumentalizing the Holocaust for domestic and international gain. The three-pronged strategy can be summarized as follows. One, seize control of previous government's projects, especially in the realms of culture, education, and national memory. Two, create new projects and mediums to showcase the official state-sponsored version of history. Three, defend Poland's good name by means of political rhetoric and diplomacy, cultural channels, and above all, legislation. These three strategic features are overlapping and not always indistinguishable in practice, distinguishable in practice nor are they always internally consistent. Nevertheless, as historian Jörg Hackmann has noted, the historical or mnemonic policy of the Law and Justice Party aims to impose a nationally as well as internationally specific vision of Polish history, or as Professor Yehuda Bauer recently put it, a usable past. The sustained attacks on professors Engelking and Grabowski can also be interpreted using this model. In Prague 1, the government seizes control of government's projects and institutions. This includes, for example, the Institute of National Remembrance, which as Professor Grabowski elsewhere has noted, cannot and should not be mistaken for an academic institution. It is rather, according to Grabowski, a branch of the Polish government responsible for enforcing the historical narrative approved by the state. Previously, the IPN, or the Institute of National Remembrance, was independently in, was, was tasked with independently investigating the Edwabna crimes. In 2002, the Institute published two volumes of in-depth studies and documents which with some minor differences, confirmed and expanded upon Jan Gross's conclusions. These findings are now fiercely challenged by some law and justice representatives. The newly restructured EPN promotes an apologetic line by historians who reaffirm the pre-Gross historiography. According to EPN's current director, Jarosław Szarek, Poles were not responsible for the Edwabna massacre. Rather, he blames the Germans exclusively for the crime, despite ample evidence to the contrary. Not surprisingly, the EPN has also recently targeted Engel, King, and Grabowski's publication, Dalias Notes which falls under the category of prong two, the creation of new projects and mediums to showcase the official state-sponsored version of history. In a highly negative review entitled Correcta Obrazu, Correcting the Picture, an IPN historian repeats standard apologetic claims that Polish violence against Jews was exceedingly rare and can almost always be attributed to the Germans who forced local Poles to participate in anti-Jewish actions. The reviewer dismisses the overwhelming evidence marshaled by Engelking, Grabowski, and their co-authors who document numerous cases of voluntary, 
unsolicited crimes against Jews by ordinary Poles in the nine counties studied. In fact, as Engelking and Grabowski note, Two out of every three Jews seeking shelter among the Polish population in the nine counties wound up perishing, most often with the involvement of their Christian neighbors. By dismissing Dalia's notes outright, the IPN distorts the history of the Holocaust in the service of Politica Historyczna. Finally, in prong three, the defense of Poland's good name, the Law and Justice Party, often through its proxies, creatively instrumentalizes the legal system. This is precisely what happened with the controversial Holocaust legislation that blew up in 2018 that effectively outlawed discussions of Poles complicity during the Holocaust. It is also in part what is occurring presently with this civil lawsuit waged against Professors Engel, King, and Grabowski. The fact that scholars who openly discuss the involvement of Poles in the Holocaust are regularly vilified by state authorities and are subject to civil lawsuits and even state prosecution has profound political implications beyond questions of academic freedom, which are also of the utmost importance. The recent targeting of professors Engelking and Grabowski is constitutive of a larger policy on history that the law and justice government has successfully implemented, exploited, and instrumentalized over the last five years. To conclude on a more optimistic note, it is important to also recognize that the law and justice government does not have a monopoly on the cultural and political memory of the nation. Critical voices have consistently challenged Polish society to interrogate its past as a means of contesting the regime's ethno-nationalist assumptions. Poles are involved in an array of Jewish cultural and memorial projects. They care for Jewish cemeteries and restore synagogues in locations with no living Jews. These practices expand the boundaries of Polish identity and they open up a sincere space for coming to terms with the past. Thank you so much. And I turn the floor back to Dr. Shliva. Okay, thank you so much to, uh, to the three presenters. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our two esteemed respondents. Professor Barbara Engelking is the founder and director of the Polish Center for Holocaust Research at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology at the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. Professor Engelking is the author, co-author, and editor of many trailblazing studies. Among them is the book with Jacek Leoczak, The Warsaw Ghetto. In Poland, Professor Engelking pioneered a focus on using personal histories of Jews. Her book, Such a, Such a Beautiful Sunny Day, charted a new research direction by focusing on Jewish survival in the countryside. And these are only two books that I mentioned out of a long list. Um, our second respondent is Jan Grabowski, who is professor at the University of Ottawa. He is the author, co-author, and editor of numerous influential works. His book, Hunt for the Jews, has won the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for 2014. His book on the role of the Polish police in the Holocaust came out in Polish recently in 2020. His most recent work, also in Polish, Poles, nothing happened, illuminates the intervention of the Polish state in shaping and distorting uh, historical consciousness. The two volumes, Night Without an End, The Faith of Jews in Selected Counties of Occupied Poland, is the most recent work edited by the two scholars. And as far as I understand, it will be it's being translated and will be published in English. 
So now I invite Professor Engel King to offer her remarks. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and thank you for the whole event. I am really honored by this, by this panel and by this webinar. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you for thank you for this free panelist. I am really happy seeing that the young generation of Holocaust researchers is so competent and committed. I appreciate your knowledge of Polish, which I guess for especially for Miranda and Jonathan is not their native language. I thank you very much, Jonathan, for your well-identified and described mechanism of the Polish government's operation in the context of political history, history politics. It is difficult to comment this, but uh, I'd like very much to express my hope that seeing how false, misleading, and frankly, stupid this policy is, it will be soon, very soon, the thing of the past. And Miranda, I appreciate very much your local study about Vodava. From the, since the book by Irena and Tomasz Gross about Golden Harvest was published some years ago, another important studies appeared concerning the inhabitants of the areas around the Holocaust camps and the fate of the post-camp territories. And your very interesting local study on Vodava is another important voice showing the readiness of the local people or maybe the every person to do evil under the influence of not only internal mechanism but such a greed for example but also by external circumstances such as impunity and alicia i appreciate i know your text about the righteous which we are always happy to publish in our uh, periodical Zagłada Żydów. And thank you for your today's piece. And uh, what I find the most interesting um, in the Malinowski story, in my opinion, this is the, this, the, the whole story has a huge educational potential. And maybe the most in, interesting is how complex and you, stre you stress this, this problem that uh, human behavior is very, is very complex and the, every person is ready to do good or evil. And this is also the, this right, this, this also is in each of us. Thank you. And Professor Grabowski, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I am uh, <coughs> very, very humbled and happy um, uh, to be here with you. And uh, it's a very, very rare opportunity um, uh, to uh, have a session devoted to uh, my honor. So uh, my great thanks go to all of you. Um, I, first of all, my duty here is to address the um, three excellent papers which we have heard. And I would like to congratulate um, uh, three of you um, on your job well done. And I will first address the, um, the two meta-historical um, essays or papers, uh, which is Alicia's and Jonathan, since you allow me to address you by your, by your first name. <clears throat> I'm somewhat familiar with uh, Alicia's work. I was not familiar with uh, Jonathan's uh, work. Uh, but um, in this case, uh, I wanted to open my short remarks saying, hey, I told you so. And it's not the best way to open, of course, uh, um, a historical debate. And um, indeed, I told everybody so, at least for the last 10 years, that things were moving in the wrong direction. And I was often decrying as someone who cries wolf. Uh, unfortunately, in both these cases that you discussed, the uh, something that I called the um, some time ago, the um, the righteous gambit, uh, which is basically the defense of the good name of the Polish nation with the righteous, using them as 
an excuse. It has been a topic which has been revolving or coming through the revolving door of Polish debates since 1950s, okay? Uh, if you track this thing, you, it pops up every time where there is political need um, about Jewish ingratitude in, 60, um, in late 50s, in 68, and then later after Boyski's essay, it comes back to haunt us again and again and again, abused. Uh, um, and unfortunately, one has to say that this defense of the good name of the Polish nation has become this last area where Poles are coming together regardless of their political stripes. And this is what makes this kind of uh, of insidious historical mythology and propaganda particularly dangerous uh, for, for all of us. It's very popular. It's very popular. It sells well, uh, and it does not need to be hammered. It simply is being swallowed uh, by the willing audience. And uh, now uh, turning to, um, to Jonathan's uh, work, I just wonder, in the beginning, you were stressing the importance of this Polish Vergangenheitsbewältigung, of this coming uh, reckoning with the past past uh, on the issue of Jan Tomasz Gross's uh, book. Uh, I just wonder how it deep it went. Uh, as we see today, um, if we look below the surface of uh, intelligentsia debates, of scholars' debates, uh, this uh, reckoning or alleged reckoning did not really penetrate uh, um, deep. Uh, where are the changes to curricula? Uh, where are the changes in terms of official narrative? Of course, they are, um, they are not to be seen. So what we see is that this debate, it was very, very, let's say, um, eminent and striking in the eyes um, of, of, of us scholars and people engaged in this, but it left layers of anti-Semitism, denial and rejections undisturbed. Uh, moving to Miranda, um, who I'm very proud to call my uh, former student, um, a, a wonderful text about Vodava showing the future and the potential of micro-research that some of us have been doing for some time. For me, also an issue which needs to be debated further, an issue of something I would call radiation zones of evil surrounding um, uh, places of horror. Uh, and of course, in this case, we are talking about Sobibur, but just recently there was in Polish a horrible book, I mean, a very good book, but horrifying book called Puczki, the Sieves, um, about people digging for gold in the area of Bełżec, also Sobibur. Um, so, uh, so this kind of uh, study of the zones of, um, of toxicity surrounding not only extermination sites, but labor camps, smaller camps, and there were hundreds of them, and they radiated evil, and as historians, we can track it down. So excellent piece with huge potential. Thank you for it. Now, just to finish my brief remarks, thank you for all your support. And uh, by you, I mean my colleagues from North America, from Western Europe. It has been of tremendous value to me over the last few months, which uh, I felt very only and this uh, the voice of my friends from the west was extraordinarily important uh, it kept me it kept me going it was invigorating to see expressions of support coming from around the world it made me understand that we are not alone and the militant nationalists perceive us as a threat it's good and one day hopefully we'll be able to say that holocaust distortion as construed and executed today by the polish state and hungarian state and lithuanian state uh, is one of the many symptoms of desperation of the crumbling authoritarian regimes. And I hope that we can one day say it, we cannot say it today. So um, I run out of time, so I would like to congratulate um, uh, speakers and thank Deborah for having thought and having organized this event. Uh, and with this, I switch off my mic and my camera and thank you once again. Thank you so much, Professor Engelkin, Professor Grabowski, for your thoughtful comments and, and feedback on the presentations of our, uh, of our three speakers. And now I, we have uh, several minutes for, to open up the discussion uh, to, our, uh, to questions from our, from our guests. And I see the questions are coming in. Um, the first question that we that we have here, and this would be, I think, for um, Alicia, are you aware of any other um, countries that were that were occupied? Um, are you aware of any other organization to combat defamation in those um, in those countries? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I'm not able to name specific 
organizations right now, but um, uh, your intuition is good that um, using um, people who rescued Jews, people who helped Jews to to deny uh, any wrongdoings by a nation is not limited to Polish case. It's perhaps extreme in the Polish case, but uh, the same mechanism we can observe. Uh, as Professor Grabowski mentioned just now and in Lithuania and Hungary, um, Latvia to a certain extent, Ukraine and so on. And um, it's not just the, the, the governments, it's also the, those right-wing nationalist non-governmental organizations often using public funds that are being active in those places as well. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, um, and now a question for Miranda. And um, this relates to what, what, the, what and how much that local people know in the um, areas around Podava Sobibor. So the question is about the radius of knowledge that sort of pushed people um, or kind of, um, yes, pushed people to benefit from the Jews' so-called disappearance um, from, from Vodava. So do you have a sense of how far that knowledge may have gone in that, in that area? That's an excellent question. So from, from my work, it seems that it has very much focused this knowledge in the town of Vodava itself. Um, I think the importance of sensory experiences, smelling and seeing what was going on was really critical to the spread of knowledge. Um, there was also one important factor was the train station located near the village of Sobibor, which people used every day going about their life. And through that, as passing by the train station and seeing what was potentially being built and seeing what was going on was an important way that knowledge spread. Um, I think to to go push to push further to understand the extent of this radius, it would be important to look at the other ghettos and other towns in Vodava County. So Ostrov, um, Parchev. I didn't focus specifically on those areas, but that would be to that would be a good way of tracing to what extent this spread. Another really important moment is, of course, the Sobibor, the uprising at Sobibor in October 1943, and that's the moment that when prisoners prisoners escaped and fled to the surrounding areas, often to attempt to establish shelter with nearby gentles. That is another kind of key moment that a lot of local people learned of the existence of the extermination camp. So that's the moment where you see this radius expand a bit further. And I think, um, look, going back to um, Professor Grabowski's work on uh, Vengdorf County, that moment um, is also where you see this radius expand. Um, but right, right now I'm working on Helm and on Krasnistov, and you do not see the same sort of emphasis in, on, in the testimonies on what was going on at either Belzhets or Sobibor. So I do believe that kind of the sensory impact of, of learning about the gas chambers and the smell of burning bodies was really critical to how the knowledge spread. And then working with the extraordinarily, undescribably violent nature of the liquidation actions in the towns themselves. Thank you so much, Miranda, for your for your, for your answer. Uh, and now I have a question for Jonathan. And again, this is a question from the audience. And I and I do encourage our guests to keep sending in those um, those questions. So, Jonathan, does the does the way that okay does law and justice presentation of history accommodate any sort of complexity that exists in most non-state scholarship, or is it completely whitewashed? Um, to be diplomatic? Uh, not really. Uh, I think that's a pretty short uh, answer is the an it, not, not really. It doesn't allow for that nuance. It creates as Alicia's presentation uh, very um, accurately portrayed, very um, rigid categories that do not allow for complexity in analyzing uh, such a tense, complicated history. I, I would say, of course, there is critical scholarship in Poland outside of this context. There's a lot of it. There's great scholarship. And of course, in honoring professors Engel, King, and Grabowski, you, can, you don't have to look too far to their work. And of course, 
the work of Professor Engel King in the Center for Holocaust uh, Research in Warsaw. And there are many publications, including the journal Zagwada Zhiduf, which also has English volumes as well, which is uh, ostensibly the most thorough and cutting edge research and critical and objective research on the topic of the pre-war context, the war and post-war Poland. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and the second set of questions. Um, uh, one of our guests is thanking, um, thanks all our, all, thanks all to all the presenters. And she was struck in listening to Miranda's presentation about the role of greed motivating um, behavior. So how much was that amplified by anti-Semitism? And have there been attempts by survivors to reclaim their property after the war? And I'll just pose two additional questions because it's from the, from the, from the same guest. Um, for Jonathan and Alicia, uh, is there a generational difference in openness to Holocaust memory in Poland? Do you think that the younger generation is perhaps more critical of their country's past or not? So perhaps Miranda, uh, you can go first. Sure. So this is this is a question where the specificity of local studies really helps us as historians understand what is going on. In the region of Voldava, there's really going from the pre-war period to the wartime period through to the post-war period, there's this key link between anti-Semitism, economic anti-Semitism. Um, anti-Semitism is rooted in this perception of Jews as controlling, having greater wealth, um, cheating poles on the market. Um, so, for instance, in Voldava, um, when Roman Domowski's Endek party um, comes to power, it sparked many um, boycotts of Jewish stores in Voldava, and often those escalated into, into violence. So, I, so, simply in the region of Voldava, economics and anti-Semitism are, are completely linked. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Jonathan, Alicia, would you like to tackle the second, um, the second question about generations and generational approaches? Um, sure, I can start. Um, I think um, in the early 90s, um, a little bit later, there was this working, working hypothesis and hope that uh, generation change would significantly change Paul's attitudes um, about anti-Semitism, about Jews and the Polish-Jewish past. I think right by now we have to unfortunately uh, admit that that did not happen. Um, the the right-wing nationalism unfortunately enjoys a lot of support among young people, um, mostly young men, uh, but not only. Uh, and we might still hope they will grow out of it, but definitely those um, um, the, the attitudes um, among Poles are not, uh, you know, um, organized um, alongside generational differences. Um, I would even say that um, the younger generation that has been um, subjected to a lot of um, that propaganda and uh, media messages and also uh, school education about um, Polish assistance to Jews um, internalizes a lot of uh, a lot of that um, not necessarily uh, accurate information. And on the other hand, the oldest generation that actually remembered the war, remembered the Jews, remembered the Holocaust, um, and passed a very unheroic uh, image. Of, of, of Paul's treatment of Jews to the next generation. Those generations, especially the countryside, they're, they're passing away, almost completely gone, those eyewitnesses. And um, in the countryside, uh, that local memory has been pretty much replaced by the top-down uh, message coming from, again, from the government, from the media, and from, from schools. 
I, I would just add one thing, which is that there is also uh, a, a sort of rural uh, urban uh, divide here as well. So in, in city centers like Krakow, like Warsaw, I think there has been at least to some extent a generational shift as the questioner asked. There are, the impact of cultural initiatives can be seen in a lot of ways. Uh, just for instance, the Jewish Culture Festival in Krakow is, according to polling and data, the most uh, identifiable event in Krakow every year now, according to polling. So there's there's interesting shifts going on, but I share Alicia's uh, caution, and I think especially within the sphere of education, uh, especially with uh, a, a significant education reform uh, in 2017 and onwards, that has had an impact on the teaching of history and will impact school children for many years to come. So we don't know how that will ultimately uh, turn out, but uh, the signs are not good. Thank you so much for, uh, for your thoughtful responses. And I, we are receiving many, many very interesting uh, questions. However, there is always this issue of time, right? And we need to finish on time and that is um, at 1.15. So um, in the interest of time, I would like to thank you, Miranda, Alicia, Jonathan, for sharing your research with us. And clearly uh, the next wave of uh, Holocaust scholars continues to ask uh, these difficult questions. And you are among these scholars who bring fresh perspectives while at the same time engaging with the groundbreaking research on the Holocaust in Poland pursued by professors Engelking and uh, Professor Grabowski. Now, I am grateful to you, Professor Grabowski, Professor Engelking, for being with us today, uh, for your insightful, most insightful comments, and also for your ongoing support of junior scholars. Um, your work, your innovative approaches to researching and, and writing about the Holocaust, uh, your commitment to giving voice to the victims, and your perseverance all that continues to serve as an inspiration. And before I pass the mic to you, Professor Dwork, I would like to thank you for envisioning this important event in honor of the two esteemed, and as you called it, them at the beginning, star historians. Um, Professor Dwork, you champion pathbreaking research and emerging and junior scholars. And that really shines through in today's program. So this new center has already launched a forum for the exchange of ideas across disciplines and generations. And for that, I thank you. And I turn over the mic to you. Thank you so very much, Joanna. And I see that we have literally two minutes left. So I would like to thank a few people and then turn the floor to our star respondents, Jan Garbowski and Barbara Engelking, if they would like to make a last remark. And my close is simply to thank everyone for their scholarship, to thank those who came in attendance and to thank the back of the house people whose work is visible through its invisibility. Doctoral student Juan Acevedo, Dr. Michael Ekstrom, Dr. Eli Karetny, and John and Steve from, G, from the GC's terrific IT department who connect us with the world while they keep us safe. And now Professors Grabowski and Yalking, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Deborah, for the for this event and for this idea to organize the panel and the webinar. And I'd like also thanks to everybody for support and solidarity 
which we uh, have seen in the last month. And as Professor Grabowski said, this was very, very important during this difficult time for us. So thank you very much and thank you, everybody. Well, I don't have anything more to add to this, just to, to tell you that we are in for a long haul and we will need your solidarity, help, assistance, and anything you have for us, it will be appreciated and gratefully accepted. So thank you once again for your effort and for your help and support. It was our pleasure, our great, great pleasure and honor. And so I wish everyone a good evening or a good afternoon or a good morning, depending upon your time zone and stay well and healthy. Bye.